about an extended evaluation, but I decided we had uh, been long enough away from 2 Thessalonians and finishing this uh, letter. And so we want to do just that. We want to turn and look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're just going to be able to introduce it today. <clears throat> And uh, we're going to read, I have 1 through 3 there, but we're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 5. And we will be probably uh, today and the next two, if not the next three Sundays in this little section. And then, and then two or three or four in the next, the rest of the letter. Uh, it's a power-packed uh, two letters, First and Second Thessalonians. So starting at verse 1 of chapter 3, <clears throat> finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you, and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to Four, to develop stability, to be equipped to face troubles and persecutions, right? You need to be stable. You need to have a good foundation, uh, a solid foundation upon which to stand. That's really verse four. To develop the attitude that it will be worth it all. In the midst of trying times, in the midst of the world throwing everything at you, in the midst of not getting your way or or things in life not being the way you think they ought to be uh, for believers or otherwise, we need to remember to stay the course because it will be worth it all. Because of God's righteous judgment in verse 5 of chapter 1, uh, God will judge righteously. And we can be assured of that and... One of my favorite uh, passages in Scripture, if I say that too many times, none of them will really be favorites, right? But I love the idea that we see here that God will turn the tables. It may seem like the unbeliever has the upper hand, that the world has the upper hand, that things are, are going in a different direction that, that we would think it should go or that God would have it go, but he will turn the tables. And we can be encouraged because of that and because also of the outcome of God's dealings. 
we may, uh, we may trust in our Lord uh, and in his character <clears throat> that he will faithfully deal with all things, right? He will be faithful to deal with everything that has happened. Nothing escapes him. Nobody can pull the wool over his eyes. Nobody can hide anything from him. He knows it all. He has seen it all. And he will judge righteously. And the outcome of all of that will result in God having his day. <clears throat> Then in chapter 2, we talked about understanding and discernment, right? Understanding and discernment. We need understanding and discernment. Why? Well, we have a responsibility to discern good and evil. I'm not going to uh, turn to that passage in Hebrews. You can look it up later. We've referenced it enough, I think. Uh, where the writer to the Hebrews talks about us pressing on and being able uh, to be mature in the faith, to discern good and evil, and to move forward. So we have a responsibility to recognize the ways and means others will seek to deceive us. And some of it is, uh, some of it is difficult because like Satan, who's behind it all, uh, the truth is distorted, where you hear some things that ring true. You hear some things that say, well, now wait a minute, I think I believe that. And then they say some other things, and if you're not discerning, you'll say, well, then it all must be true, instead of saying, now wait a minute. Even though this part rings true, this other stuff, no, that's not true. And you'll recognize it and not be led astray. And not be led astray, right? So we have a responsibility that others will, will seek to deceive us, will seek to do these things in our lives, and it makes it difficult for us. So verse 2 of chapter 2, remember, either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, Paul said. So representing the apostle Paul, someone speaks or sends off a letter, counterfeiting, trying to counterfeit Paul and trying to represent him, nevertheless being deceitful in the whole process, and representing the truth of God another way. And so Paul says, even though these things have happened, don't be fooled by them. Because we've already taught you about these things. And that's why, uh, beloved, we spend our time, most of our time, in this way, looking at the scripture section by section by section. And sometimes even in more detail than that. So we have a responsibility to recognize the ways and means others will seek to deceive us. Then it was a spirit or a message or a letter. Uh, we might say today, what are the things today? Social media stuff, uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and email or something uh, to that effect. Uh, that they'll send out things. You know, I have... <clears throat> And I kid you not, I can show you letters that I received from people here in the cities. One claimed to be Jehovah. And I just thought, wow. Who believes that? And yet, there are those that do. So literally, a letter came to this church and and this is Jehovah, high priest, Melchizedek of God, and so on and so on. And he's putting forth a prophetic message, and I'm supposed to just swallow it and bring the church along with me. That's the kind of thing. Now, some of it might be more obvious than others, right? But, but as near as I can tell, anybody that proclaims falsehood does not warn you about it beforehand. 
They don't say, oh, and by the way, don't listen to anything that I say. I'm going to be teaching you falsehood, right? No, they, they, uh, they sort of ride herd on the truth a little bit to suck you in and then lead you astray by other things, and we have to be very careful. Today we have certain televangelists, tracts, emails, letters that come our way, uh, and it's amazing, and may contain partial truths, but they're still falsehoods, right? Which undermine the truth of God. Well, today we are introducing a new theme, and that new uh, theme is faithfulness, faithfulness. <clears throat> <clears throat> faithfulness in the church, our faithful God, and so on. Uh, verse 3, the very first phrase. We're, not gonna, we're gonna be developing it a little bit as we go along, but, but the Lord is faithful, right? That's key for us to understand this passage, but the Lord is faithful. All of this hinges on the faithful God who communicates his truth uh, the truth of his word faithfully, with which we are to respond faithfully. So, what does it mean? <clears throat> well, let's look at uh, a dictionary meaning. It means reliable, trustworthy, loyal, sure, true, dependable, and unfailing. And you might see that last word and think, well, can I be faithful then because I'm not always unfailing, right? We fail. Uh, but I think we can still achieve faithfulness by God's grace. So certainly God is faithful all the time. And he keeps loving kindness and truth. Exodus 34, verse 6. I'm not sure why that went superscript on me, but... Uh, that's actually Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord God, uh, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. That word loving kindness is hesed. And it is variously translated by the, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It often uses uh, the word for mercy. In there, but that and that captures some of it, but that doesn't capture all of it. And I think everything that we see in the dictionary meaning there reliable, trustworthy, loyal, sure, true, dependable, unfailing all of that is involved really. Mercy, love, loyalty associated with his covenant and with his people. Uh, God sets his has said upon his people, his covenant love upon them, and he sustains them. But what we're talking about is that God is faithful. God is this all the time. He is unfailing. He is loyal and sure and true. He is consistent with his name and is loyal to his own name and that's a good thing because we need that in our lives. We need him to be loyal to his name and represent his name faithfully to us that we might know him. We need to know him. Even Moses, you know, up in the mountain, Lord, show me your name. Show me this that I might know you and know your ways. And this was Moses after another two years of walking with God, but spending time in his actual presence. And you think, well, if Moses struggled with that, what about me? Well, that's the same thing. That's why we continue to press on in a knowledge of our God and his faithfulness. And when there is a failing, it falls squarely upon our shoulders and not his. It is not, we can never point to him and say, God, I mean, we can, right? But it doesn't do us any good. We could point to him and say, God, this is, 
if you wouldn't have done this or allowed this, I'd be much better off. It's your fault. No, not ever. Not ever. Not ever his fault. And certainly with God's help, by his grace, we should strive to be faithful day by day and moment by moment thinking of how we represent our faithful God who keeps loving kindness and truth. How we represent our God faithfully and who keeps loving kindness and truth. That's what we want to emulate. That's, what, that's who we want to follow. <clears throat> what does it mean for us? Well, well, who wouldn't want to be faithful? We, mean, we might not think of it as intensely sometimes as we should, but really, who wouldn't want to be faithful? Who wouldn't want to be that person that could be counted upon, right? That's very important. Yet, we all know what it is like to have failed and to have someone fail you. Have you ever failed? Yeah, if I were to ask, Everyone to raise your hands who's ever failed, well, all of our hands would go up, right? Or at least they should, because we have failed. And others have failed us. And it makes life a little messy. It makes it a little hard. But what we have to remember is that even in the midst of not always living up to what we need to be or should be, God never fails. So he takes account of our failures between each other. And we still may trust him and in his faithfulness to bring good about. We don't have to get all bent out of shape thinking someone failed me and now it's going to all fall apart. No, God is greater than even our failings, our stumbles. He is always faithful. And it does hurt, doesn't it? Especially when in, an, in, a, in a significant situation and you're really counting on someone and, and then it falls through and you think, oh, it hurts. But it's all, all before God and he knows and he will carry us through and he will make it right. Faithfulness then is a quality we need so desperately in life, right? We talk about it in the three branches of government, in the judicial system, the legislative, executive, the system and the people involved in all of that. We pray every week here together for faithfulness. For faithfulness. And it's important we keep that up. But it's not just about government. It's about the home, right? And it is about the church. We want to see faithfulness in the church, in the home, and in society at large. We want to see it everywhere, in all our institutions. Where does it start? Perhaps it starts in the home and the church collectively. And society can be transformed as the people are faithful, then the other things will fall into place. We need to be careful. <clears throat> it's reflected in our prayer. Faithfulness is reflected in our prayer for the ministry of the word. Now we're just really getting started here, but look at verses 1 and 2. Look at how Paul writes this. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you, and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. Okay? That's the prayer he asks for. It isn't... It isn't a, a statement of fact, an indicative so much. It's an interrogative. Will you pray for me? Pray for the ministry of the word. 
You know of Paul's passion for the church and its well-being and how he prayed for the church in various ways. We have encountered that many times, haven't we? And we've settled on those times that we come across and how Paul is praying for the church and what he's asking and, and setting forth that as, as a, a template for us to pray for the church and each other and so on. And now he's, he's praying, asking for prayer. Pray for us, for the ministry of the word to go forth, bear fruit, and so on. And so we observe Paul asking for prayer, and this points up the kind of precious relationship that we should have with our Lord the faithful one, he asks us to come to his throne of grace and with each other to pray, to ask. <clears throat> it, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea for posting in some way those who teach Sunday school, those who are involved in youth group and kids club, Pray for the ministry of the word in these areas. We know that the word goes forth and doesn't return void, but accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it. Pray. Pray that that word would go forth and be planted in these hearts and these opportunities. In Sunday school, in, in uh, kids club, in youth, in here now. Remember that for each other. He asks, he asks two things of them concerning the ministry of the word, and we're going to develop this uh, next time, I think, but I want to mention them now. Pray for us concerning the ministry of the word that it would run with accomplishment. It would spread rapidly and be glorified, is my translation, that it would run with accomplishment. Now we know that that's God's promise, and we know that in the end we'll see that, yeah, God's word went forth and it accomplished everything, but he also ordains the means. That is, he wants you to be involved in his plan and purpose. He wants you to be praying because that's how he accomplishes it. Because you have prayed. And maybe it is because you have prayed for the Sunday school teacher or whoever it is in the ministry of the word that it would run with accomplishment. It would spread rapidly. Notice, just as it did also with you. The other thing, in the ministry of the word is there are obstacles sometimes, right? Yes, there are. So that's the second part of the prayer. That the word would run with accomplishment and that human obstacles, we don't have to limit it to human obstacles. We know there are demons and so forth that seek to prevent these kinds of things from happening, so we can pray against that as well, but that these obstacles would be overcome. See, that's the second part, verse 2, and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith, for not all are faithful. Not all have the faith. There will be opposition. So you might be sharing the word with two other people. And you might be sharing your faith and presenting the gospel or something. And then you have that third person seeking to undermine you while you're sharing with one who seems to be interested. Well, that's an obstacle, you see to be overcome. 
That's why the prayer is twofold. It would run with accomplishment and overcome obstacles. We're going we're gonna to get into that more, I think, next time as well. But I wanted us to hang our hat there for a moment. Purposeful praying hinges first on prayer for the ministry of the word in whatever form that may take. It is not just about pulpit ministry, although it does include that. Certainly, we want the Word of God to run rapidly here and accomplish, right? But we want it on another level as well. Prayer is needed for the ministry of the Word here at Lake Phelan. That the Word of God may continue to take hold of our lives and bear much fruit in us, and through us for the sake of God's glorious name. I want you to remember as Peter describes it, the word is the seed that is implanted within us and this seed, and may this seed germinate and send down deep roots and sprout forth in each of our lives bearing much fruit for the glory of God, 1 Peter 1.23. The word of God is a seed implanted And we want to grow thereby. And we want to pray that accordingly. And may I also say that in reference to last week in, evaluate, in evaluation of going on with God, that our goal is that the ministry of the word, whether personal or corporate, would be effective in us and that it would bear much fruit in our lives. It is about the ministry of the word of truth, the gospel in general. Prayer is needed for every, for every life context in which the word of truth may be shared. And it is our desire to see the word of God bear fruit in all of our lives and in those lives with which we, it comes in contact. impacting young and old alike that each one may behold the wonder of the glory of God. I, I guess I didn't have this uh, up at the time when I sent it over to have it reproduced, but in Acts chapter 20, verses 18 to 20, Paul gives us some insight into the ministry of the word. And I want to read that for you. I'm sorry I didn't have it printed up on the slide, I guess, at the time. It must have been something I added after. In Acts chapter 20, verses 18 to 20, Paul writes, You yourselves know, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly, corporately, together, and from house to house. There is a more public, general corporate proclamation of the word and house to house there is a more personal proclamation of the word and beloved if you are sharing your faith that is a personal proclamation of the word and we need to be praying for you that the word of God would, would run rapidly in accomplishment praying at the same time that all obstacles that might be there would be overcome so that Christ would have his way in the life of this other person that you're talking with. I hope that makes sense. It's an exciting way to begin to think about praying. And then you begin to look for avenues of, of seeing it happen. 
and reporting about it and what God is doing and what he has done. And that breeds excitement. And that's what we need. Why purposeful praying? Because there are those who stand opposed. Right? Verse 2, that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. To be sure, Satan stands opposed to all things, to all things in terms of the truth of God. But there are those who stand opposed to the ministry of the word as well. And we need to pray against that. We need to pray that obstacles would be overcome. And we know that there is nothing that can hinder who God is or what he wants to accomplish, right? And if that is true, we need to pray accordingly. But, right, we have the faithful God who stands with his word. We have his protection. Look at verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. How about that? You may look out in your sphere of influence and you may be able to count on more than your fingers and toes how many people are unfaithful. And you might get so caught up in thinking about opposition and how people are just not getting it or whatever else. We need to change that attitude and embrace, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. In the ministry of the word personally and corporately, our faithful God will see to it that his word goes forth in accomplishment. Praise God for that. We may be assured that as Christ has the victory, so the church will not be prevented from fulfilling its purpose and calling. Obstacles are just that. They are obstacles. They cannot prevent God from accomplishing his purpose, though. And he is faithful to see it through. As we wind up this time together, the challenge, the challenge for us is to reflect that faithfulness, to be faithful regardless of what any other institution or person does. So the worst thing that we can do is look at the government and say, man, that government, <laughs> how unfaithful, boy. I'm going to show them unfaithfulness. No, that's not how we fight. That's not how we move forward. Yeah, you might be unfaithful in what you're doing, but I will not be. See, that's what we need prayer for. That's what makes this work. That's what God stands by. If you are defending his name, beloved, you have no better ally than the Lord God of heaven and earth standing by your side, living within you, defending you. And it's like, I want to do so much. Just start going forth and let me show you what I can do. When you defend his name. Faithful, regardless of what any other institution or person does. Therefore, to be faithful in our praying, but with a purpose. To advance the cause of Christ in the word of truth going forth, whatever form that may take, in, in a personal or corporate manner. 
to understand that there will be opposition to the word of truth, but to also understand that our faithful God stands with his church to protect it and to further, to further the work of the word and his purpose in the world. Our gracious God, thank you for your word to us and all that it means. And Lord, we thank you for uh, also the ministry of the word in whatever form that takes. And Lord, maybe we don't do it enough. And we need to pray not just generally for different things, but also more specifically for our teachers. And, and so we lift up Lisa to you, and we lift up Becky and Alan to you, and we lift up the other helpers in Kids Club and in youth to you, and others who have taught Sunday school and may teach in the future. Lord, that you would bless their efforts and cause your word to, to run with accomplishment, to run with accomplishment, overcoming all obstacles. So in the, in the public corporate ministry of the word, and also personally, Lord, for each of those here who have had opportunity and will have opportunity to share their faith and to share from the word of God, that in that personal house-to-house, -house, so to speak, setting, that your word would run with accomplishment and accomplish your purposes, that many more might come to know you and that your name would be exalted. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you have done, for your patience with us, and for all that you will accomplish. And we give you the glory through Christ. Amen.